Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the second lesson for Beliefs and Values for Personal School uh, for the Year 10 classes and we are looking uh, currently at the topic of who makes decisions and this is the second lesson in the series so we are going to be working our way through uh, how people make decisions uh, to run a country, how people make decisions in a democracy. Um, so yeah we're going to have a look at lots of uh, different ideas and different branches of government as we work our way through. Hello, everybody. Hi. Uh, hope you're all well. Hope everything's going okay. I hope you're managing to do things that you love, as well as studying hard. Uh, for this lesson, you'll need a notebook, of course, or some paper, so that you can take notes uh, of what uh, you are learning through the day. And also, uh, a reminder that when we get to any tasks, um, I will pause what I'm saying for about five seconds or so, but uh, that's your opportunity to pause the video, go and complete the task, and then come back, uh, press unpause, and I will be waiting for you. I will be here, full of anticipation, ready to see what joys that you have completed in the tasks. So, yeah, uh, we're gonna be looking at um, really uh, a lot of different aspects today and we're going to look at the idea of separation of powers so you know um, whoever runs a country obviously there's a lot of power you're making decisions on behalf of what well, for our country 67 million people uh, that's a lot of influence to have so we will be thinking about how how do you exercise that power how you use it who should use it uh, and how we make sure that the wrong people uh, don't get power or don't get too much power as well. So we will crack on with the lesson. Okay. So how does our country work? Well, I'm going to ask you to just have a little think at the start of the lesson. I'm going to ask you to take some time to reflect and ask yourself some questions. And I'd like you to write down your thoughts. Yeah. Try to make sure that you're in a nice, quiet environment. <laughs> Try to give yourself time to think about these questions uh, because although they seem like really simple questions, in reality, they're probably a lot more complex than they appear. So first I want to ask you, what is power? We talk about power um, and we might talk about authority. We might talk about influence, but you know, what is it? What is it to have power? What is power? Um, why is it beneficial? What's the good side of being in a position of power? Uh, and also, why is it dangerous? What are the risks with it? Um, <clears throat> I want you to think about what type of person should and shouldn't have power. Now, with this, I'm not looking for specific examples. I'm sure we could come up with a whole range of examples, but I want you to think more about the type of person, the characteristics of a person who would be suited to having power, who would use power wisely. Uh, in the words of Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, and I also want you to think about, you know, um, what sort of person should not have power. So the characteristics of people who should not be allowed to have that authority and that much influence. So I'm going to go quiet for five seconds and I would like you please to pause the video, go and have a little think and write down your answers. Make sure you explain in detail, please, uh, wherever possible. Um, okay, I shall be here waiting for you when you're complete. Please pause the video. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi again. Um, I find that first question really interesting. And you know, with the beliefs and values, I, I look at uh, religion um, and uh, you know faith as well as citizenship and how our country runs and uh, personal well-being and uh, economic well-being and a lot of different topics. Uh, but for me, kind of the time I asked the question about what power is was actually from a, a bit of the Bible that says not by power nor by might, uh, but by God. Uh, and I, it made me think, well, what's the difference between power and might? Um, might is physical force, strength. So, you know, there are some people who use 
their might to gain power. Um, it's a particular characteristics perhaps sometimes of bullies. But power is more about influence. Your ability to make decisions on behalf of yourself, but also on behalf of other people. Uh, so leadership is about that influence and authority and power, if you like, as well. Um, there are lots of benefits. You can do a lot of good in a position of power. You can make decisions that will benefit people. Uh, and you do get a lot of people who are really selfless leaders who uh, are in it for the right reasons, who do it uh, to change the world, uh, to make a difference and to help people. Uh, but also you get people who seek positions of power and authority because it's in their own interests. Uh, they do it for uh, selfish reasons and selfish gains. And probably selfishness is uh, one of the traits that you would probably say is not suited to power when you're thinking about a type of person. Uh, and being selfless, wanting to make a difference, those are the things you would expect to see in a person of power. Um, being in a position of power does not mean that you have all the answers and that you are an expert in every area and that you can do everything. Sometimes power is something that you need to be able to uh, enable other people to use. So having a position of power might mean that you enable somebody uh, to make a difference on your behalf. So delegation is a really important characteristic in a leader and in someone who is in a position of power. Hopefully you've got a whole range of different reasons there. Uh, in class, if we, we were all sat in a classroom at our desks, all 30 people sat there um, completely unsocially distanced, uh, <laughs> we would be able to have more of a, a discussion and a debate about that. Uh, but it is a really big and interesting question. And I'm not sure it's one we fully got the answers to yet. Okay, so where do we start? Well, power. If we're thinking about it from the perspective of our country and democracy, we should probably start with English monarchs. You will have learned quite a bit about kings and queens and our history as a nation uh, within your English lessons. Um, the reality of our history is that for a large portion uh, of that time, we were run by a monarchy. Um, and that could be great. You could have kings and queens who ruled our nation fairly and ruled it in the interests of people and saw it as a great responsibility that they had. But then you also had people who were, well, less suited uh, for power. Uh, King George, um, who um, basically exceeded power to the colonies in the United States, you know, often referred to as Mad King George. Should you have someone in power who has taken leave of their census? Well, the problem was the kings and queens you couldn't do anything about. They were in authority and that was it, uh, particularly in the cases before King John. Uh, however, uh, the situation changed. Um, you know, we went from a situation where the king or queen had total authority, authority given to them by God. Uh, they were not accountable to anybody else. They weren't accountable to courts. Or, or parliament or anything. They were the sole decider of justice, of truth, of how the country was run. But the Magna Carta changed that. Um, this document was an incredible piece of work. Um, ironically, at the time, it turned out to be a very temporary arrangement, but it's probably the document that led to justice uh, and the right to be innocent until proven guilty, the right to have a trial, and also the document that built the foundation uh, of people and the population having authority and power. Uh, so we're going to watch this. Let me have a little work with this and see what you think. <laughs> This may look like a plain, unassuming piece of parchment, but it's actually one of the most famous documents in the world. Magna Carta, meaning the Great Charter, has inspired people across the centuries 
from Thomas Jefferson to Mahatma Gandhi. But why was the Charter originally created and what does it actually say? Let us take you back to medieval England. It's the year 1215 and the ruler is King John. Many people believe that King John was one of the worst kings in history. He imprisoned his former wife, he starved his opponents to death, he allegedly murdered his own nephew and pulled the beards of the Irish chiefs. King John had imposed heavy taxes on his barons in order to pay for his expensive foreign wars. If they refused to pay, he punished them severely or seized their property. The barons demanded that King John obey the law. When he refused, they captured London and John was forced to negotiate. The two sides met at Rugby in June 1215. The result of the negotiations was written down by the King's class into the document we know as Magna Carta. Although most of the Charter clauses dealt with medieval rights and customs, Magna Carta has become a powerful symbol of liberty around the world. The most famous clause, which is still part of the law today, for the first time it gave all free men the right to justice and a fair trial. No man shall be arrested or imprisoned except by the judgment of their evils and by the law of the land. To no one will be set up under this law to as much as it was his sons. The charter only applied to free men. The vast majority of people in 1215 were unfree peasants who were ruled over by their landowners. And although Magna Carta was intended to create peace between King John and his rebellious barons, England was plunged into the civil war after the Pope declared the Charter had been found. When King John died of dysentery in 1216, nine-year-old Henry III took to the throne. To keep the peace, Magna Carta was reissued several times during the 13th century, until it was finally made part of English law. Magna Carta has lived on for 800 years and it is echoed in the United States Declaration of Independence and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Perhaps Magna Carta's most important legacy is that everyone, including our leaders, must obey the law. What started out as a document of specific complaints from a group of barons has turned into an international symbol of their liberty without which we might not have the rights we value so much today. So as you can tell, this is, uh, was a really important milestone in people gaining power and the principle of uh, people uh, holding the power and rulers ruling on their behalf rather than their own, own self-interest. Um, so I've got some thoughts here from some powerful people uh, throughout history for us to have a little think about. Um, there's some really interesting quotes uh, that we can have a look at here. Okay, first one, Baron de Montesquieu. It is necessary for the very nature of things that power should be a check to power. Now, that might sound a bit confusing, but it's the basic principle that um, if somebody is in power, there should be somebody else in power who can limit that person's power and make sure that they can't do everything that they want and get away with blue murder, really. Um, another quote for you, Edmund Burke, the greater the power, the more dangerous the abuse. This is a really big thing. Um, if you put people in power, you give them the chance to make decisions and have influence on things. Um, and it comes with a lot of responsibility. And history is littered with people who have had power and misused it. Um, uh, several examples have led to war. We, we think of a lot of dictators uh, that have been around. A lot of people who have shocking human rights records. Um, Hitler himself, you know, was a very convincing person. His power was initially 
in his ability to argue and convince people. Um, and he was given power of leadership and authority that led to a huge world war um, and an absolute crisis for every nation on the planet. Uh, another quote for you here. Um, you know, I love musicals, so Alexander Hamilton, it's no surprise that there's a Hamilton quote in here. And he said, when the government betrays the people by amassing too much power and becoming tyrannical, the people have no choice but to exercise their original right of self-defense to fight the government. Now, that's um, a really inflammatory statement, but you, you've got to understand that this is a group of people who are being run. This is a nation being run from across the Atlantic. Britain was making the decisions. Britain was doing uh, what it did at the time, which was an uncomfortable truth, but the reality of the situation is where we were involved in uh, the slave trade um, and the shocking involvement with that. Uh, we were involved in taking natural resources and exploiting nations who were part of the British Empire that we ruled. Uh, and America rose up against that. Uh, they said no, uh, they rejected British government and decided on independence, which led to a huge civil war. But within this statement as well, you've got the principle of protest. If a government is doing something wrong, if somebody in government or the whole government is too powerful, then protest is the difference. The people can claim back their right. They can use the power that they have as the people to change the world. If the people who are ruling do not represent people, then the people can rise up and they can challenge it and they can protest and they can vote people out. And in the extreme circumstance of the colonial Americas, uh, they can claim independence. Another quote from James Madison, uh, the essence of government is power and power, lodged as it is, must be in human hands will therefore, well, yeah, will ever be liable to its abuse. Let me try that again, but actually saying the worst. The essence of some government is power, and power, lodged as it is, must be in human hands, will ever be liable to abuse. Which is basically saying, if you have humans in charge, uh, there is the risk of people using power wrongly, and there is a need to control and limit that power. It is not surprising that a lot of these quotes are from Americans. Um, the colonies and the movement for independence uh, was heavily driven by the fact that uh, they were ruled from afar. They were ruled by a king uh, in a different nation who exploited and used their resources but thought very little of them and gave them very little credit in return and didn't really listen to their concerns and issues. Abraham Lincoln, one of the founding fathers, brought together this principle which was echoed in the Magna Carta. Democracy is government of the people. So you are ruling over the people of the nation by the people. So there must be people of your nation for the people. So it must be done not on your own personal behalf but on the behalf of those people. Uh, constitutions and power. Well, in order to limit power, often we put things in writing. Um, we form a constitution. Uh, a constitution, well, I was going to give you a definition of a constitution, but you know what? I'm not going to. I would like you to have a little think about it. I would like you to think about what a constitution is. I want you to think about how you would define a constitution. So you might want to start with a constitution is <laughs> an obvious sense of sentence start, but it's there. And then I want you to tell me what it is in your own words. And I want you to have a think about maybe some examples of a constitution. So have a little think about it. Uh, I'm going to wait here. You can pause the video. Come back to me when you've completed it. See you in a moment.
Okay, welcome back. Uh, a constitution. Well, the dictionary definition is it is a body of fundamental principles or an established precedence according to which a state or other organization is acknowledged to be governed. Let me break that down into a more modern phrasing. Okay, a body, okay, a document, if you like, or uh, an agreement of the principles, rules, and the way a country is run. So those principles may be, you know, written down or they may be commonly acceptable. Precedents, you know, so this is the way we've done it before, so we accept this is the way it is done now. Uh, a state or other organization. Usually when we talk about constitutions, we talk about countries, but organization, organizations have constitutions as well. Uh, religious bodies have constitutions. These are the things we believe. These are the principles by which we are run. And for a nation, this is what we hold dear. This is how our country will be run. Now, that's really interesting because I said it was a document and it could be, but it doesn't have to be. The United States of America did choose to have a written constitution. We the people of the United States of America and, and that whole document is quite an interesting read for more able students among you or for those who are really interested. Go and have a look on uh, Google. Google is your friend. Uh, go and have a little look uh, and you will find some stuff about the American Constitution. Have a little read about it because it is quite fascinating. The American Constitution um, puts together the principles uh, that every decision in America has to be accountable to. So the courts and how the courts are run. You know, well, that's based on the Constitution. The role of the president and the job the president does is based in the Constitution. How elections work are based in the Constitution. The role of their equivalent of our parliament, uh, the Houses of Congress and the House of Representatives, all there within the Constitution. And some basic principles uh, within the US Constitution on the rights that people have. They are written down. Now that is absolutely fabulous. It means that somebody can't just decide to do something uh, and get away with it. Um, a president could make a decision uh, about an issue, but the courts could decide that it is unconstitutional. Even if it's trying to write a law or make a, an executive announcement about something, if it is unconstitutional, it is overturned. It doesn't matter if he's the president, he still doesn't get his way because the Constitution of America is more important. And it's written down in law, it's written down in paper, you cannot overrule it. It is there absolutely clear for people to see. Hmm. Now, let's compare that to the United Kingdom. Where is the United Kingdom Constitution? Well, we don't actually have a written constitution. <sighs> Shock horror. Um, <coughs> you can run a country without a written constitution. America chose, because probably they were rebelling against the United Kingdom, uh, to have a, a written constitution, but we've always gone down a different route. Um, instead of having a constitution, let me just move myself a little bit to the corner. Uh, so you can see clear. Instead of having a constitution uh, that's written down, we have loads of bit that, bits of law um, that are written that are constitutional. Uh, they are the, our laws that are written by parliament dictate uh, what those in power can and can't do. Uh, we also have a strange situation uh, where it's made up of different aspects as well, like tradition. Uh, sometimes this is referred to as convention. Um, let me give you an example. If there's a general election and one party does not have a majority, they don't have enough MPs uh, to outnumber the rest of the MPs, uh, <clears throat> then, well, who, who goes into power? It's not straightforward. Now, there is nothing written down about who should run the country in that circumstance. Uh, you could have somebody who runs the country, a prime minister and a government, who are a minority government where they have less MPs than the other side and effectively the opposition can block every single law they make. 
or you can have a coalition. You may have one, two, three, four, five, ten parties share together and work together as a team, agree on the principles and form a government. So who gets the right to do that? Well, traditionally, conventionally, the Queen will ask someone to try and form a government. Usually, with convention, uh, she will ask the person who was the Prime Minister before the general election to try and form a government and see if they can do it. But there isn't technically anything written down in the law to say that that is the way it has to be done, which is a bit strange, but, you know, it kind of works within the United Kingdom. What works for America is great. What works for us is brilliant. Here's the thing. If you have in writing, well, there are advantages and there are disadvantages. So I want you just to have a little think. I want you to use your own thoughts here. I don't want you to, you know, sort of research anything. I want you just to have a think about the reason of this situation. If you have a written constitution, there are some advantages with that. You might also think there are some disadvantages. And for more able students, or for those who really want a bit of a challenge, then I would encourage you to write three advantages and three disadvantages, maybe more. Uh, there are also advantages of not having it all written down, perhaps a bit more flexibility in certain points, but there are disadvantages. Take some time to have a little think about it. I'd like you to come up with at least three reasons why it's an advantage to have a written constitution, three reasons why it's an advantage to have an unwritten constitution. And as I say, for more able students, um, or for those who have a real interest in this area, if you want to try it with disadvantages of a written constitution, and disadvantages of an unwritten constitution. Woo, more power to you, bring it on, go for it. Excellent. So I will pause here and sit in silence for about five seconds. Uh, you can pause the video um, and go complete that. And I'm here waiting for when you're done. Okay, hopefully you've got some stuff down there. I mean, one advantage, obviously, and maybe you've got this down, uh, of a written constitution is that um, it gives people protection. It is written down clearly what the President of the United States can and cannot do in law. It's uh, written down clearly what powers he has, what powers Congress has, what powers the judiciary or the judges have. You know, it is all very, very clear there. Um, perhaps a disadvantage of that is in order to change something on the Constitution, the President has to approve it, the courts have to approve it, the House of Congress has to approve it with a two-thirds majority. Uh, so two in every three have to vote yes for it, and the House of Representatives have to approve it two-thirds majority as well. So it's very, very diff difficult, difficult to change the Constitution. Now that has real-life implications. For instance, within the Second Amendment of the Constitution, uh, you, Americans have the right to bear arms, which means it is within their constitution that Americans can own and carry firearms. Um, the challenge with that is obviously there is a significant amount of gun crime in the United States and it is very difficult to legally limit the fact that they can have those weapons because it's in the constitution and it is so difficult to change. An advantage perhaps of an unwritten constitution, you've got flexibility. You know, you can, you can make decisions uh, facing stuff you've never come across before. Uh, it's been really interesting with all the COVID-19 stuff. The Parliament has been given new powers and authority and they're finding new ways of working uh, to adapt to a virus uh, that has significantly threatened the lives of many British people and the economics of us as a nation and how our country is run. And we have changed the way uh, we have run. And we have that flexibility because we have an unwritten constitution. Um, one of the downsides of that is, um, how do you protect things? How do you make sure that uh, you know, somebody doesn't take too much advantage and change the rules too much? You know, where do you draw the limits? So there are big questions in both of those areas. Well, where do you draw the limits is an interesting point. Uh, we're going to look at a topic called separation of powers. Now, 
one of the key principles to ensure that one person doesn't have too much power is this idea. Separation of power. You don't put your eggs all in one basket. You put them in different places. And it's the same with power. You don't give absolute power to one person. There's an old quote, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. The more power you give someone, the more they could do right, but also the more power they have to do wrong. This is where power and responsibility is split between people to ensure that nobody becomes too powerful. Every single group that has power is restricted by another group that has power. It's a bit like a, a chain, you know, where one can limit the other power and the other can limit, and they go around. This kind of sounds a bit vague, so let me talk about the United States. Well, we have a president. Okay, so we have, that is what we call the executive branch. Effectively, the president and his people act like our government. They run the country. Uh, for all practical purposes, they make things happen. The president is a little different from our prime minister and our government in that he has that power, but he is also known as what we call the head of state. And in the United Kingdom, of course, our head of state is the monarch or the king and queen. If you see there, the president is the commander in chief. You know, he is the person or she is the person in charge of the military. They choose key leaders, so they choose uh, the secretaries of state for things like defense, foreign affairs, uh, labor, which is work, um, veterans affairs, health, all those different things. Um, they choose those. Uh, they also choose judges, and more importantly, Supreme Court judges. And the president has the right to veto. In other words, he ha as a veto, he has the right to block laws uh, that Congress uh, would want to put forward. That's an incredibly powerful uh, position, you know, but he is the representative of the United States of America in one person. You know, he is the commander in chief. Um, a lot of the time, uh, the presidents of the United States have been referred to as the leader of the free world. You know, it's that kind of principle. Sorry for the terrible American accent. Um, another factor is um, the Houses of Congress. Now, there are two parts to the House of Congress. Um, there is the House of Representatives and there is the uh, Senate, um, which kind of works a bit like our Parliament uh, in that you have um, the House of Commons where people are elected and they make decisions. And we have the House of Lords uh, who are there to scrutinize laws. They're there to check. Uh, that the laws that are being made are good and also they have the power to block those. So the Americans work in a similar system. They have their House of Congress and, and the Senate. The Senate is the one that checks and could potentially block or change laws. Now, <clears throat> they must approve things like military action. They can also veto the leaders that the president would want to choose. They can block. So if he picks one of his best mates, or, you know, that... Uh, you know, isn't necessarily suited to the job. Uh, they can be interviewed by Congress and they can uh, fail to approve that person for the role and they can't get the job. Uh, they can write laws um, um, and, you know, once they've been voted on in Congress and in Senate, those laws actually become laws, but they do go to the president for a final approval and he does have the right to veto them. Here's the thing. If a president vetoes the law, then it goes back to Congress and they can overrule the president again, as long as they have two thirds. So first time, as long as you've got more than 50% of the votes, it becomes a law. If the president vetoes it, you've got to have more than 66% of the votes in order to be able to make it a law, which is much, much harder. Uh, they can, this is incredible, they can censor or censure uh, or impeach the president. Now, for those of you who do keep up with politics, you will know that uh, the president was censured about some stuff that happened in the Ukraine. He was effectively put on trial uh, by the Congress uh, and by the Senate. Um, and they then, as a Congress or Senate, decide 
on his guilt or innocence. So it's like having for the, for the Senate a, a hundred man jury. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, pretty incredible powers that they have there. And the, the men and women in Congress, um, uh, more of them were Republican. Uh, so they voted for him not to be impeached. Impeached means basically that they're found guilty of the crime and they can be removed from the presidency. Okay. Uh, the Houses of Congress and Senate can summon people to give evidence before them. They have uh, committees uh, that they bring people uh, before. Now they have the power to pretty much require almost anyone to come in front of them and give account. Uh, not necessarily the president, but the president, ironically, is required once a year to go in front of the House of Congress and the House, uh, the House of Representatives, the Senate and the Congress. He goes before all the members of that and he is required to give a speech about the state of the Union in the United States. Uh, so he goes and gives a speech uh, for that. That is a legal requirement. Why is it a legal requirement? because it's written in the Constitution. Their written Constitution means he must, absolutely must, do that under all circumstances. Uh, they scrutinize and check laws. They scrutinize and check how government is working. Uh, they check policies and making sure that the country has been run well and effectively. And you also have the judiciary. Now that's the courts. Um, but within that, they, America has a Supreme Court. Uh, these are seven chief justices uh, and these are uh, Supreme Court justices are incredibly powerful now they are nominated by the president the president is the one who decides who's going to be put forward for it I'm just going to remove my little video there uh, I'll or, and put myself in a corner where you can see me uh, please bear with bear with bear with let me go ready one two three <sighs> like magic um, yeah he uh, can uh, so the Supreme Court uh, justices are nominated by the president but they have to be approved by uh, Congress uh, so there's a protection there Congress can't decide who it's going to be the president does but Congress can decide if he gets his way or not the courts make judgment based on the law so the law that is written by the Congress uh, and approved by the president uh, or then enforced by the Supreme Court. So the power of the law is split into three different areas. Separation of powers. That's kind of the whole principle of what we're looking at. Nobody has all the power. Nobody has all the decision. Uh, they can rule if laws are legal. So for instance, if the Congress write a law and the president approves it, that becomes law. Well, actually not necessarily because the Supreme Court can rule that a law is unconstitutional. If it is unconstitutional, if it doesn't match up to their written constitution, it doesn't matter what that law says. If it's unconstitutional, it's thrown out. Uh, they cannot be sacked. Wow. Imagine that. You become a justice or a chief justice and you can never be sacked. Now that sounds great. No way, it's got dead easy, I can take it easy. Um, <laughs> there is that, you do have a lot of power, but basically what that means is that you can make a decision that Congress doesn't like and they're not gonna be able to remove you. You don't have to worry about making a decision that will protect your job. You can make unpopular decisions. Disagree with the president, you know, and challenge what the president's doing. Speak out against it without fear of losing your job. Supreme Court justices particularly, you know, are appointed quite rarely because they cannot be removed from office. Not easily, unless they commit a serious federal offence. Uh, the current uh, Chief Justice is a very old lady. Uh, she uh, hasn't been taken out of power. She's still in power. She will decide if she retires. If ever she retires, she cannot be made to retire. She is in that position of authority to challenge the government in terms of the Congress and challenge the president. Uh, they can rule uh, 
if Congress or the President breaks the law uh, and bring them to account as well. So if a President is impeached or put on trial, um, the Chief Justice is the person who sits uh, there and runs how that whole process works to make sure that it is fair uh, and just. Okay, let's move on. Come on, where is, there we go. Here's the thing, they're all separate. All of these branches of government are independent and separate, but they are held accountable by each other. No one group has overall power. The president has some power that's blocked by Congress or blocked by the Supreme Courts. Congress has power that is blocked by the Supreme Courts or the president. The Supreme Courts have power that is limited by Congress and the President. Nobody has absolute power. So, in the UK, uh, it's kind of similar-ish, maybe, kind of. Uh, we have a, the similar principle, uh, but it kind of works slightly differently. Uh, instead of an executive branch or a President, we have a monarch. Now, the monarch is the head of state, they're the representative of our nation. Uh, when they speak, it's really important, uh, you know, but they represent the nation. If people, uh, other visitors or the leaders, say the president of the US comes to the UK, uh, it would be traditional for uh, them to be uh, hosted by the queen. Uh, they are, head of state is significant, um, gets to speak on behalf of and as the voice of the nation. And technically speaking, the monarch, the current king or queen, can block laws. Now, it's called royal assent when a king or queen approves law. And it's traditional, <laughs> constitutional tradition. Originally, the king or queen would have to sign every single law. Uh, and then they changed it and made it to convention where it was... Uh, you know, the, a message was sent to the king and queen about what the law was about, and they could look at it and they could decide to sign it or not. Um, you know, or they could just say, "Oh yes, just 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 that, that won't be approved." Assume that I'm going to say yes, unless I actually say no, rather than literally signing on a piece of paper. Um, so they can technically do it. I think the last time a king or queen uh, blocked a law and didn't give assent. Uh, was 1607 and it was the Militia Act which was a law which allowed private landowners to form their own armies. Now you can understand why a king or queen will probably want to have the only army in a country and not have other people having their own little militaries you know maybe overthrowing their power. Um, so that was the last time it was blocked. Uh, we know that uh, Queen Elizabeth II uh, was uh, involved in hunting. Uh, uh, she used to enjoy that pastime. Uh, and, um, you know, the then Parliament passed a law to ban fox hunting. Now the Queen could have technically turned around and gone, oh, no, we're not having that here. Yeah. Well, one will not pass this law. I enjoy my hunting and I'm not going to let this happen. And she could have blocked it. But convention means the King or Queen doesn't block laws. Uh, so it's just a theoretical power that they have. Oh, my head has appeared in the wrong place again. So let me do a nice hello, hello. Right, Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court, before we had uh, the courts and we had um, the Lord Chief Justice uh, and we had people like that, but. Uh, a while ago, uh, Britain went down the, the route of having a Supreme Court. So we have seven Supreme Court justices. They are appointed uh, not by the Prime Minister or the King or Queen, uh, but by an independent panel who rule on uh, whether this person is the appropriate, the right person uh, to have this level of power. Uh, they can rule on all legal matters. They can even rule if the government that wrote the law has broken the law. Um, however, in the UK, Supreme Just, uh, Court Justices uh, do not have the power uh, to uh, stay in office forever. There is actually a compulsory retirement age for them. 
so they can't stay there forever. Uh, but they are the final legal word. Uh, they weren't until Brexit. Uh, because the Supreme Court was the final legal word on any matter except human rights issues. And for that, the European Court of Human Rights overrules even nations uh, in terms of that. However, now that we have Brexit, once the agreement is finalised, then the Supreme Court will become the total authority on every legal matter, including human rights. Then we have Parliament. Now, Parliament is kind of a bit of a blend of the American executive and the American legislature. Don't forget that um, when you have a president, you have a head of state, not a monarch, but a head of state, and you have the leader of the executive. In ours, the head of state is separate, but the executive and the legislature, the people who write the laws and the people who run the country, belong to the same body. So uh, within the UK, you have um, Parliament, uh, which is uh, the collection of all uh, the MPs in the House of Commons. Um, traditionally, that's 650 members of Parliament rep representing different areas or constituencies across the UK. Um, that is led by the Speaker of the House of Commons. Uh, you, it's split into two sides, so you have the government benches. Uh, the government are the party, uh, and the people, particularly the people within the party, who are nominated to take responsibilities for things like education, health, uh, roads, taxation, finances, you, all that sort of thing. Um, and the other side is the opposition. Their job is to keep the government held to account and check that they're not doing what they shouldn't be doing. Then you've got the House of Lords. Now, the House of Lords is not elected. But think of it a bit like the American Supreme Court, right, where the justices can't be sacked if they disagree with the, prime, with the president. Well, the House of Lords, once you're in there, you're in there. You cannot be removed. Um, and so from that perspective, you can sit there and you can block a law that would just be wrong. You can block it and it doesn't matter if the government are peeved off with you, if the whole of Parliament are peeved off with you, if it's a really unpopular decision. You know, if you feel it is the right thing to block that law, you can do so without fear of losing your job or being threatened or intimidated in any way. Traditionally, the House of Lords was made up of hereditary peers, people who had titles, and you've got your title because your father had the title and it was passed down like that. Uh, nowadays, uh, you have what are called life peers who are there, uh, you know, uh, for their life, uh, uh, but they don't pass on the right to sit in the House of Lords to their children. Uh, a lot of people uh, within it are specialists and experts. So you might have some people who are experts in business. Lord Sugar, you know, if you think of The Apprentice, well, you know, he was made Lord. He has the right to sit in the House of Lords and will have that right to his dying day. Uh, Dame Tanigray Thompson is in there now. She uh, is obviously a Paralympian, former Paralympian, and an expert on all matters relating to disability. Uh, Professor Robert Winston became Lord Winston. Now he is a leading uh, fertility expert and geneticist. And so obviously a great mind to have when you're looking at law uh, that deals with medical issues. And that's the role of the House of Lords. They're effectively the experts checking what is going on. When a law is written by the House of Commons, they can check it. And they can also write laws themselves, which are then checked by the House of Commons. The Prime Minister, right, we do not elect government. Let's make this clear. When you vote, when you're old enough to vote, you will not vote for a political party. You will not vote for a government. You will not vote for a Prime Minister. You vote for a representative for your constituency. You vote somebody in as a member of Parliament. Now, they have a manifesto, which is their promise, if you like. Uh, they belong, perhaps, to a party. So you might think, I agree with the principles of uh, one particular party. Let's say the, uh, let's pick something uh, completely random, uh, the Purple Party. 
okay that you've looked at their policies you agree with what they say as a purple policy and they say if we have enough, enough MPs we'll form a government and we will run the country on these policies and you look on the ballot paper and there's Joe Bloggs for the Conservatives Jeff Bloggs for Labour uh, Jane Bloggs for the Liberal Democrats uh, and Julian Juliet Bloggs for the Green Party right and then Jack Bloggs uh, for the Purple Party and you can then put your name by it you are voting for Jack but you are not you are voting for the individual not the party but he is saying if you vote for me I will represent the views of this party whoever has the majority in Parliament when all the MPs are elected whichever party has the biggest majority elects the Prime Minister we don't elect our Prime Minister in the US you vote for who's going to represent you in your area but you also vote for who will be the President of the United States. Okay, now here you will notice on this little charty warty, there we go, um, that the lines cross over a little bit. And that's a really important principle. Our system works slightly different to America. Um, and yes, we do have um, some things where, hold on, we do this and I will get out of your way where there is a bit of a crossover. So for instance, uh, the king or queen decide who are going to be knighted, uh, but some nobility uh, and knights of the realm and lords of the realm uh, you know, made that position by the king or queen, um, which are also approved by the government, sit in the House of Lords. Um, there is a bit of a crossover between the Supreme Court and the legal aspects of things and Parliament in that you have some people in the House of Lords who are known as Law Lords. They are there because they are legal experts um, and so they've been brought in to scrutinise laws but they actually, before the Supreme Court, the Law Lords were the final authority on anything legal in the country. And technically speaking, the Crown, you know, is uh, oversees the, uh, the courts. Um, uh, when somebody has a legal case that is brought by the courts, it is the crown versus, you know, uh, it is effectively the queen bringing that legal case uh, uh, in all criminal matters, certainly, um, rather than, you know, the prime minister or the government. There is a little bit of crossover between all of those things. Now, that does that mean that who has power it gets a bit messy? Yes, sometimes it can. But also it does mean that we perhaps have a little bit more conversation between the branches of government than other countries may. Not entirely separate, but still held to account uh, to each other. Right, ladies and gentlemen, what I would like you to do, I am going to give you uh, some words. Um, and I want you to see if you can write, having looked at what we've looked at, uh, your own definition uh, for some key terms. So the terms I want you to look at, the monarchy, the judiciary, parliament, government, the constitution, separation of powers, and legislature. I want you to see if you can write definitions for those, please. So in a minute, you can pause the video and you can go write those, and I will just go silent for a few seconds, and then when you come back, press and pause, and we'll carry on. For more able students among you, for those more able subject specific students, uh, uh, or for anyone who just really finds this area interesting, uh, if you want to die, uh, uh, do some other terms, you can. Uh, you could look at words, for instance, like executive. Uh, you could look at convention. Uh, you could even look at the word case law, you know, where uh, they are decided by circumstances. Uh, maybe you want to write those definitions as well as a little extension task. If you do, go for it. I thoroughly recommend doing it. What's the worst that happens? You learn something. Hey, that's why we're here. Brilliant. So if you would like to pause the video now, uh, I will wait here. I will see your happy smiling faces when you return. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We're getting really close to this. I know this has been a remarkably long lesson. Actually, I am nearly on the hour. You will be very glad. Uh, oh, by the way, yeah, yeah, there's some definition terms, executive. Veto, really good word to look at for a definition. Scrutiny, 
uh, as well. Hopefully you've got some very clear uh, definitions there as well. Um, what I would like you to do to carry on from this lesson, so we're very nearly finished, we'll be very glad to know. I want you to have a little thing. For the more able subject students, uh, and again, as I say, you know, this is not an exclusive thing. You can go for it. If you're interested in this stuff, you do it. You go for it. I ain't going to stop you if you want to do it at all. I'm just going to pat you on the back and go, a nice one. Actually, I'm going to pat you on the back socially distanced because, of course, we don't want to be beyond the two meters. Um, yeah, just go for it. Any of these tasks anyone can do, but this is a challenge for more able students or for those who are interested. Uh, I would like you to compare and contrast the UK and the US systems for democracy. Evaluate how well they work, to what extent they work, what perhaps works better in the United States and what works better in the UK. Is there anything we can learn in the UK from the United States? Is there anything they can learn from us? So you can evaluate as well. What I'd like you to do is evaluate the different branches of government and how they limit powers. Now in America, that's very, very strong separation of power. In the UK, yeah, the edges get a bit blurry. Which was better? Now you can take your pick of those. You can do one or the other. Uh, the bottom one, hopefully everyone will decide to do. Uh, the top one perhaps is a little more challenging, a little more detailed, uh, but rise to the challenge. You can do it. Uh, sorry, turning into Bob the Builder. Bob the Builder, can we do it? Yes, we can. Um, you can also do both if you want, and that would be great. Uh, yeah, so that is a little task for you to do at home and after this lesson is finished. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your patience and time. Thank you very much for giving me an, nearly an hour uh, to have a chat with you about this. Uh, I would say you've listened wonderfully. Um, <laughs> I say that in good faith. I hope you've listened wonderfully. I hope you've done the written work in plenty of detail with plenty of examples. And I hope you're looking forward to the next Beliefs and Values lesson. Have a great day.